join me in giving our panelists a warm welcome. Thank you. I'll let the two of you introduce yourselves and take it away. Thank you. All right, so I'm Yash Kotari. Uh, I'm the PH specialist at University of Louisville, so I'm in town and I'm local. I'm Jillian Lung. I'm a cardiology trained pharmacist and I specialize in pulmonary hypertension um, at University of Kentucky Healthcare. Today we're excited to talk to you about the fight against medication side effects. Um, to start, we have no conflict of interest to discuss. So at the end of the session, I want you all to know what different therapy options there are for PAH or other types of PH that we may talk about. Recognize the possible side effects because not only will these medications help you in the long run for your heart and lungs, it also can bring side effects, which sometimes can be pretty hard to manage. And I talk to a lot of my patients about them. So hopefully you can get some tips and tricks and bring it back to your team and to, for your own use. Lastly, know who your resources are and what you need to do to conquer these side effects so that you can fight pH. We all should already um, kind of be familiar with these side um, symptoms of clinical presentation of pH. So people may tell, them, tell us that they're really tired. They may feel they're lightheaded, um, have chest pain. Majority of people feel like they're short of breath. Some people can have palpitations and a good portion of people also have swelling. And the medications sometimes don't help because they create these side effects too. And I'm talking to a group who are passionate about the treatment of pH. So you all should be already familiar with all the different groups. So I won't talk to you, talk your ears off about these different types. pH um, has been around for a long time, but um, therapy options weren't really developed and on the market until 1995, at least in the US. Um, even though we have a lot more people who are being recognized to have PAH, there's still only a slim population in our country and across the world that has PAH. So a lot needs to be done to raise the recognition of this disease state and knowing that this group is resilient and still need our support. Clinicians, caregivers, and yourselves. So let's talk about goals of therapy. Now we've found different medications that can be started for, for the treatment of PAH. Our goal as clinicians is to help you meet your own goals. It can be my patients want to go to their daughter's wedding and be able to walk down the aisle. So we can help with that with medications. It can be they want to see their grandchildren grow up or take care of their children. Help you function the way that you want to function, do the activities that you want to do it um, on the daily lives. Um, also improve your breathing and quality of life because that's what it matters. We can treat your numbers, we can treat your lab tests, but if you're not really feeling better, I don't know what we're doing. Um, you're part of the team and we wanna hear about how you're doing so that we know how to do our job to facilitate that. Um, prevent and pre reverse that disease progression and hopefully help you live a longer and healthier life. So there are a lot of therapy options. Um, I color coded them um, into four, four different groups of medications. Um, the first group on the top left is calcium channel blockers. Only a very small portions of people are actually um, responding to calcium channel blockers and a lot of us may be using these medications just for high blood pressure. Um, so these include amlodipine, dotiazem, nifedipine, verapamil. You may recognize them by their brand names. The second class is the nitric oxide pathway. And um, Chris already alluded to them this morning as well. Um, these are the, the yellow, the uh, lilac, and the green are the three pathways that we have proven to be the causes of pH that we know so far. There are newer pathways to be discovered still and a lot of medications in the pipeline, um, but the, the nitric, pathway ox, uh, nitric oxide pathway medications include sodenafil, tadalafil, and riosiquat. Um, you may know these medications by different names traditionally used in men, um, so a lot of times we get a kick of it when we talk about these medications with our patients. We have the lilac group, which is endothelin receptor antagonists, um, ambrycentin, bocentin, and mesotentin. 
Um, lastly, we have prostacycline pathway medications. Ibuprostenol, and I have the brand names on here, um, but I won't, I won't refer to them as the brand names, just to keep the bias um, away from this um, presentation. We have Eloprost, Triprostenil, and Celexipec. Um, so all three, or all four, classes of medications help us widen these blood vessels that are narrowed in people who have pulmonary hypertension, help you breathe better, and help you function better in the long run. All these medications are not benign. So I want you, the main thing to take away is to find out who on your team, on your clinician team, you need to contact should you experience any side effects. A lot of our patients are really resilient. They've been breathing poorly for years until they are finally diagnosed. So they see these medications as you know, life-saving medications, then they may not tell us that they're suffering from side effects, and they sometimes we don't find out until you come back to clinic. We want to know before you come back to clinic because there's a lot of things that we can do to help you feel better and also reap the benefits from these medications. Always report to us. If you don't know who to report to at your clinic yet, utilize your specialty pharmacy support system and talk to your nurses and your pharmacist there. Also, I think important to note is that we ha gotta be patient with your side effects. We don't want you to have side effects because that's not our goal. Um, but sometimes these side effects can take a while, can take multiple medications or interventions for them to actually go away. So work with us, be patient with us. We're trying and we may not be able to wave our magic wands and make them disappear right away, but we want you to hopefully not abruptly stop your medications um, so that we don't have any of those um, unexpected severe effects should you just suddenly discontinue your medications. So the first class of medications we'll talk about, I'll, st I'll talk about the first two classes, and then Dr. Kothari would talk about the other two classes. Um, these are calcium channel blockers. A lot of us maybe are already on it. Um, main side effects of these medications can include flushing. So not only can these medications widen the blood vessels in your lungs, they can also widen the blood vessels just under your skin. So a lot of us may look redder than before we start these medications. That's to be expected, and there are things that we can do. Um, patients can have heartburn, they can have leg and feet swelling, lower blood pressure, because these medications are also used for blood pressure lowering, and also lower heart rate. So I hope this slide is large enough for you to see the text. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can mitigate these side effects So you're, for your flushing. There's not too much we can do about it, um, but keeping your house less humid and less hot, avoiding these hot and humid places can help improve your comfort. For heartburn, there's a lot of over-the-counter medications that can be used to help. So these can be your antacids, they're fast acting, They'll help your heartburn quicker than the other guys. Um, there's famotidine and then the other um, proton pump inhibitors, the lansoprazole, omeprazole, pantoprazole. Some of these require prescriptions, so you may have to talk to your doctors about that. For leg and feet swelling, specifically for this class of calcium channel blockers, they're cosmetic effects only. They do not mean that you're gaining fluids, but it's just your fluid is being drawn to the outside vessels and they present to be larger than they, they were before. So aside from just the appearance of your extremities that you're looking for, um, when I call my patients, I always ask, ask them, hey, what's your most recent weight? And what other symptoms do you, do you currently experience? Because your increase in weight or maybe your worsening in breathing can tell us that, hmm, maybe it's just not, it's not the cosmetic effects of calcium channel blockers. It's really you're having increased swelling and we need to treat that and help you um, urinate better. Um, lower blood pressure. So whenever we start any of these medications, when you get up, don't start running to places. Don't go chase after your grandchildren right away. Kind of get up, anchor yourself from your, when you um, get up from a bed or a chair so that you know you're not gonna fall over and hurt yourself. Um, lower heart rate. Um, talk to your care team and we can tweak your other medications to make sure that um, these blood pressures and heart rates are being managed correctly. 
The second group is endothelin receptor antagonists. So these are the three medications. Main thing, which is so interesting, is that this medi medication class causes increased swelling. So a lot of times when patients start on these medications, I call them about a week after and I say, hey, are you more swollen than before? How much do you weigh this week? And they sometimes would, would tell me, oh yeah, my, my breathing is worse, I'm swollen, I've gained five pounds. And I would tell them this is normal. It's anticipated, we know this was gonna happen and that's why I'm calling you right now and we can treat this. Um, people can get headache from vasodilating or widening your blood vessels that may happen in your head as well. Um, heartburn, for our young females in the room, these medications um, are associated with a REMS program through the FDA because it can cause harm to the unborn fetus. So we require people to be on reliable contraceptives and also be taking pregnancy tests every month. Um, we already talked about the swelling and some nasal congestion as well. Bocentin specifically can cause liver toxicity. So a lot of times we don't even start patients on this medication anymore because there's better ones in the same class that can cause the same good effects, so we try to avoid that so that we don't have as many problems in our hands. So we already talked about flushing last time, about calcium channel blockers. Um, harm to unborn fetus, if you've been to um, our nurse coordinator, Kim Jackson and Dr. Andrew Kolojay's session, we are, they already talked about kind of what to do should a person, a patient gets pregnant, um, contact your PH team immediately because there are things that we need to do, stop this class of medications and follow up closely to make sure that pregnant patient is being well taken care of. For headaches, your best friend is acetaminophen. Avoid your NSAIDs medications because those can, th those like um, ibuprofen or naproxen can increase swelling. And this class already causes swelling. We don't need more swelling in you. Um, maybe small amount of caffeine can help or ice compresses. Specific agents will be determined and discussed between you and your clinicians. Um, heartburn we already talked about. This leg swelling would be real. They're not cosmetic. So we would need to increase your diuretic or fluid pill and then because when you're urinating more, your potassium also gets pulled into the urine, we may have to add more of those large potassium pills to you. Um, those also come in different formulations that are better to be swallowed. So talk to your care team if that's an issue that you're facing. And then lastly, nasal congestion. Try not to use a lot of medications in the, those nasal spray. The normal saline nasal spray can help. And then if you already have seasonal allergies, we can talk about antihistamines, over-the-counter, daily pills that can help with that as well. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Kothari to tell you about the rest. All right, so we're gonna start with the nitric oxide pathway. And as mentioned, these are commonly used for, they were initially used for erectile dysfunction until we found the positive benefits in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and with these, the side effects you have to worry about the most commonly is, like we already talked about mentioned, uh, flushing, headache, heartburn, lower blood pressure, and then you have a little bit more muscle pain and dizziness. The vision changes are rare. I have yet to see a patient with them, but they are known to happen. And once again, um, especially with REMS, uh, Rio Seguat especially does cause harm to the unborn fetus, so it's gonna have the same requirements for uh, contraception and pregnancy testing. Okay, so how do we deal with them? Um, so dizziness, blood pressure, we already talked about a lot of that is with positional changes, so as you change from laying down to sitting up or sitting up to standing, do that slowly. Um, the flushing, also as mentioned earlier, um, we're just gonna try and avoid hot, humid places. Um, the muscle pain, once again, Tylenol is your friend, avoid NSAIDs. Um, small amounts of caffeine is absolutely acceptable, and ice compresses. Um, the vision change, if it's, it's a rare side effect, but if you do see that, it's probably best to contact your care team. You might need uh, further workup. And then the last, uh, drug class, the prostacyclin pathway. 
Um, oh, as sorry, I don't know if we mentioned this earlier, but the two, all the classes we talked about so far are oral. All are oral agents. Prostacyclin pathway, we have a little more variety. So these are our IV, subcutaneous, and oral agents. So these are the three parenteral pumps that we use for them. Um, the one on the left, the CAD legacy pump, is the oldest one, and that's the one we use for patients on IV remodulin. Um, the other two pumps are subcutaneous, and I think we are now at a place where all new patients are gonna be just getting their immunity pump, which is the one on the far right. And then this is the Tyve, so this is an inhaled medication. So the old, the older version of it is the one on the left, that's a nebulizer. And now the new dry powdered inhaler, which is the one on the right, that was just released last year. And those, they have different cartridges for the amount of dosing medication. So you'll start with a lower dose and then titrate yourself up to the higher doses. Okay, so the side effects of these medications, a lot of the same type of stuff, um, except now we have to add things like jaw pain and diarrhea, um, as well as infusion site pain, and because we have an inhaled medication, you can have some throat discomfort and coughing. Okay, so how do we manage these? Um, the coughing, throat irritation, um, I would probably just rinse your mouth out after taking the medication and um, you can try some phenol-based uh, throat sprays for it. The diarrhea, loperamide is usually very effective in um, taking care of the diarrhea. Um, the dizziness, low blood pressure, flushing, headache, we've already kind of talked about a little bit. Um, the flushing and the headache, the jaw pain tend to be more when you're titrating up the medication. So when you first start them and you're increasing your doses, you'll see them more. But eventually, within a matter of probably a couple of weeks, your body will adjust to the increased dose and the side effects are usually much better tolerated. The nausea vomiting you can use, um, most of these are prescription, but the Zofran, which is the brand name, uh, Ondanstron and uh, Promethazine, you can use scopolamine patches. Um, reach out to your care team if you're having a lot of nausea. And then the side pain, infusion, um, irritation is, you can use uh, topical creams, um, same thing, Tylenol again, as well as aloe vera gel and ice compresses. A lot of times changing the site will help resolve some of these pain, some of these symptoms. Okay, so in summary, um, the goals of these medications is to help you feel better. Obviously there are gonna be side effects with them and with some of these strategies we discussed, they can help you manage the side effects. The biggest thing is to not discontinue medications just because of side effects without contacting your care team. So if you have any side effects that you feel are not manageable, please reach out to your care team. And um, just let us know. We're here to help you guys and let us know if there's anything else we can help you with. Okay. Perfect. Right on schedule. Um, so just a reminder for questions, if folks would raise your hand, I'll run the mic to you. That's especially important since we're recording this session. Um, try to keep your questions general. And um, if we need to, we'll paraphrase them from the front. I see a question already. My question is the PLO gel. What does that do? Because I remember using it at the beginning when I went on sub-Q. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't remember it ever really helping. So what does it actually do? Yeah, the question is um, how or whether the PLO gel would be helpful. Um, and, if, and Dr. Kothari, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe there's a few different ingredients and it's a compounded uh, medication that's topical. And so in, it includes an analgesic, something for inflammation, and also an antihistamine. So the concept of this PLO gel is that the antihistamine would be able to help with some of that swelling and redness and then that analgesic or pain medicine in there can help with some of that pain. And I echo what you're saying. It's not 
very, very effective just because a lot of those sites can be very painful and irritate, irritating to start with. So I, I would say if I was, if you were my patient, I tell them to use a multi-pronged effort. So including your acetaminophen, using your PLO gel, um, we may be able to use um, fluticasone spray, then that's a steroid, usually used as a nasal spray, and it's repurposed to actually help with inflammation on, on site pain. Really? And mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, some people use um, hydrocortisone for that. Um, the lidocaine touches. Mm -hmm. I, I just cut, you know, a like smaller section. Small, small sections, mm -hmm. and I just put it around my side. But I find um, my legs and like the, my back are the best places. When I go on my stomach, I have more pain hmm. with the sites, um, and they don't last as long. I, I try to go every five weeks. Um, and when I go on my stomach, it's like four, maybe three. And I don't know, it just kind of stinks. I like it better on my stomach, but I know I can't. Yeah. It won't, I can't prolong it. So. Yeah, but that's a good idea to do a lidocaine patch. I think that, that may be applicable to some of our audience members as well. I use my, the back of my arms for my sub Q, and I've tried a lot of different things, and uh, ice packs seem to work the best for me. Um, I tried the PLL, PLO gel, didn't do much, but the ice really does help, especially if you catch it right in the beginning, it'll start constricting. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question I had, what's the difference with the new pump? compared to the diabetes pump? So from what I understand, the new pump, um, the immunity pump, it's supposed to be waterproof, so it's easier to take a shower with. Okay. And um, it doesn't have any buttons on the pump itself, so you have an actual small remote that you use to adjust your medication, and it will alarm you, same as the other pump, if you're getting low. But I think the biggest reason, the biggest um, benefit I've found in patients is that it's smaller, it's much more compact, and so it's easier to kind of tuck under a band or tuck into your okay. pocket and stuff, yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to comment on when I get ready to take a shower, I use the skin barrier wipes on my skin around my sub Q, and then I put the AquaGuard on, and it makes it stick right to your skin. skin. I've tried press and seal, and the barrier skin wipes really made a difference. Um, do you have the site pain still? Yeah, you still will have the same site-related effects because it's still going under the skin. It's just the actual pump is significantly smaller, and it's water-resistant. So, Did they get rid of the one, the Medtronic one, the one that goes under the skin that you have to get... Um, I guess, have it refilled? Um, Did they get rid of that? Is that not even an option anymore? I'm not, sh I'm not, I haven't seen that one, so I'm not sure if it's a, even still available. I believe it's not available it's anymore. It's not, the, the study just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my question. <laughs> Are there specific medications that we should not take in having PAH besides decongestants and the NSAIDs, are there other medications that we should not take? Hmm. You actually already nailed it with the, so the question was, is are there any medications that cannot be taken with PAH? Um, so Karen already told us about de nasal decongestant like pseudoephedrine as well as NSAIDs because it increases the risk of swelling. Um, in general, I, I don't think there is other specific medications that cannot be taken in general for everybody. Um, I don't know if you no, thought I don't, of anything. I don't think there's a specific class of medications that you cannot take. I think it depends on your individual care plan. I would, in general, suggest that, you know, discuss all your medications with your yeah. PH team to make sure that everything's in order. Um, there are certain specific situations where certain things might make things worse, but if they're temporary, we can probably get by with it. 
Yeah, and one thing that I do want to mention, there's a lot of drug-drug interactions that exist with pH medications. Um, specifically, since we're at, hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic, a lot of these antiviral medications for COVID-19 interact with a lot of the pH medications. And sometimes I see um, patients going to urgent care and getting these medications filled, and they the urgent care physicians, they are really, really fast paced and they're not, maybe not fami as familiar with PAH and they would prescribe certain medications. But a lot of our patients do call us when they get started on certain medications at, prescribed by some other providers and then we would gasp a little bit and say, hey, we need to kind of tweak your other medications while you're taking these medications. Um, another thing that I do want to mention, which is interesting, um, smoking can actually interact with Rio Seaguat. Um, it actually reduces the concentration by 50%. So if you or your friends who are on Rio Seaguat and think about picking up smoking again or continues to smoke, I would consider quitting or l at least let, let your care team know so that they may adjust your doses or change you to a different medications. Um, just a suggestion. Uh, vitamins are blockers um, for the oral medication people that are taking the orals um, to not take it before or right after um, you've taken your pH medicine because it'll block it. Is that right? That's not, I, I don't usually make that recommendation, but that, that may be just yeah. I'm not aware yeah. as much. I mean, it might, it also probably depends on which vitamin you're talking about and which but formulation. Be, um, okay. Are at the same time. Thank you. Any tips and tricks to share with our friends? Or questions for our friends or us? I was on sub Q remodulin for three and a half years, and then I switched to Aranitram. But I find that um, the side effects with Aranitram, especially with diarrhea, are worse when I eat certain foods. Um, so my suggestion and what I do, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I um, take the anti-diarrhea pills. I take two with each dose that I take the, rem the three times a day. So I take, take, it, take it with the medicine after I eat, and that seems to help a lot. And um, I have to watch the fibrous foods that really um, make me sit on the toilet for a while. Anyway, so that's kind of a tip. And um, also, you have to make, for me, I have to make sure I have enough fat, um, like peanut butter or cheese, or a little bit of carbs to eat with the with the Renatram. I've had it before in the past with just a banana or strawberries and a miserable, terrible side effects because the pill itself is not dissolve, dissolved. It doesn't dissolve. So it's a very um, slow release. So I find um, with the fat and the carbs, even just if it's a teaspoon, it makes a huge difference with the side effects and, and nausea and, and stomach aches and stuff like that. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Our friend here is very, actually very insightful. Um, pairing your um, loperamide with your doses um, because some things to note, and it actually applies to headaches as well. Some, sometimes patients call me and they have headache. They keep on taking acetaminophen after their doses of medications. So some, sometimes we discuss the strategies of taking your medicines with the medicine that is for your side effect, for your maybe headache, because knowing that the headache medications may take 30 minutes to an hour to start working, um, and so if you can get ahead of it and prevent it, it could be a better strategy and just supplement if you don't 
have enough relief from those um, pain pills. Um, you also, I wanted to comment on um, the peanut butter and the cracker and the cheese. Um, I like that idea. I always tell my patients to take a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat with their oral triprostanil pill. Um, another thing to note is that you want some pr protein and fat, but not a lot of protein and fat. Um, I've had people who would sometimes eat a snack with their oral triprostanil. Sometimes they would have a large dinner. And usually, when they take the pill with large dinners, they feel so much more awful with their side effects, just because a large amount of fats and protein can ex um, significantly increase the absorption of that particular dose. So the key would be be consistent. I don't want you to not eat and then get, get the side effects. I don't want you to have a large meal either, because then you're gonna have a lot of side effects, and it may make people think, hmm, this is doing more harm than benefit for me right now at this second, and they may try to reduce their doses by themselves or abruptly stop it, and that's not what we want as well. I have some friends who I know have kept pretty rigorous food diaries when they started some of these medications to really understand I need exactly 250 calories at exactly this time before or after my medication. It probably doesn't work for everybody, but may be helpful. Yeah. Well, we have time for more questions, but I'm certainly not gonna keep folks just to keep you. Panelists, do you have any final words of advice or things that you were hoping to cover that we didn't have time for? No, I think in general, this was, we were just talking more about the side effects of the medications, but in general, if you have a question or a concern about whether, is it a medication side effect? Is it just worsening pH? reach out to your team because there are ways we can kind of determine. Karen has another question. So, you know, I have to take the medicine three times a day. Um, you know, before I was on sub-Q, so it was continue. Um, and I hate to say it, once in a great while, I'll accidentally miss a dose. And Usually the next day, I feel awful. And I'm guessing that because the medicine's not in me, is that, you know, I have terrible headaches and fatigue. I feel like I have the flu um, or um, jet lag. So usually the next day I try to do nothing if I can. But um, I'm not sure if you know, I, I don't double the dose. I just skip it and take the next, next dose one. if I accidentally take it. Um, and I find the next day I just feel terrible. So I learn my lesson and, you know, try not to miss. But we're all human and sometimes that, that, that happens. So, but it's just part of the, because the medicine's not in me, that's why the, that I feel terrible the next day, correct? Yeah, so the medications are designed to maintain a certain level of the drug in your body. And if you skip a dose, the overall level will decrease, you know? So it's gonna take some time for that dose to get caught back up, so. So you all um, talked about side effects and um, management of side effects, and a lot of that management includes more medication. And I've often had patients say, uh, I'm, I'm tired of taking so many pills, and why would I wanna take something that I'm gonna have to take more medicine uh, for? Do you have strategies to deal with those patients or to try to encourage them? So I think in general, I put it this way is, you know, do you want to feel better? Like, I mean, I understand the pill burden that we have to deal with, but a lot of times we see a dramatic improvement in patients' functional status just by starting a single agent. So that's usually the argument I make to them is we can get you to feel better and to be able to do more if you just take one pill and one another medication for the side effect of it. And as Jillian mentioned earlier, most of the side effects 
your body will get accustomed to over a period of time. So that's pretty much the strategy is you just have to deal with it for a, hopefully a brief amount of time before they get away. Yeah, and I'll harp on this as well. Never feel like you're a burden to your healthcare team. If you're having a side effect and you're thinking, why am I on these pills to treat the side effects from these pills. Um, I usually, when they when people call me, they have my direct number um, for people that I take care of. I would tell them, hey, these other ancillary pills are for us to al allow you to take the medications that can potentially be life-saving and that can help you feel so much better and help reverse the progression that has been done to your lungs and for your heart. So. Again, be patient. Um, we, we don't want you to be on a lot of pills because increased pill burden means that maybe you'll forget a dose of the other pill. Um, but hopefully we can work together to help tweaking of the timing of those side effect pills, tweaking the doses of those side effect pills. Or if you really can't tolerate a certain dose, sometimes we have to unfortunately decrease the dose, but at least people are feeling okay, still getting the benefit, and not just stopping it abruptly. So we'll help make sure that you stay positive along the whole journey. I have a suggestion for forgetting. Um, I'm on a dempest, so I have to take it three times a day. Um, I put alarms on my phone, and then I put a 20-minute timer after the alarm for that, and then it, so it's a reminder if I hadn't taken my medication to, to take it then. That's an excellent idea. I will do that. Okay. Yep. Thank you. What a great spot to end. Thank you so much. And please join me in giving our panelists a round of applause.